taped uh, back in August. So uh, at least the Alex Jones show is still on the air so I can uh, settle for the guest appearances. Uh, well, I know your show. show was popular, but you were a busy guy. Yeah. So we want to welcome you on whenever you want to come on or, you know, because uh, you, your analysis is so needed. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, but there's so much to discuss. I mean, you hit on a lot of topics there in the introduction, so I don't know necessarily where to start. But just to say that I think as we ring in this new year, I think that there is a bigger disconnect right now between what people expect to happen, particularly uh, in Wall Street, people that manage other people's money and economists. You know, I think there's a bigger disconnect now between what people expect to happen and what is going to happen than Anything I've seen, I think, in my career, which is saying a lot because it certainly includes the dot-com bubble that burst in 2000 and the real estate bubble that burst and ushered in the financial crisis, I think people are more clueless today with respect to the true state of the U.S. economy and what is lying right around the corner than they were in 1999, in January 2000, rather, or January 2008. Sure, there's that famous story of uh, JFK's dad, the big stockbroker, uh, Joseph Kennedy, and he says he dumped all his stock weeks before the crash when a shoeshine boy was telling him that the market would never go down and telling him what stocks to buy. Now, whether that story is true or not, I think it's indicative of the type of uh, irrational exuberance, to use a Greenspanian uh, type <laughs> quote, that we see 18,000 uh, Dow. What's really behind this? Yeah. And, and what are you saying is really coming uh, versus uh, the euphoria? Yeah, you know, even Alan Greenspan is starting to come clean now. I guess now that he's getting closer to you know, meeting his maker, he, he wants to uh, get a few things off his chest. So he's starting to criticize the Federal Reserve, criticize quantitative easing. He's telling people that they should buy gold. It'd be great if you can get him as a guest guest on your show uh, now that he's, you know, coming back from the dark side, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, Darth Vader, you know, uh, sure. you know <laughs> coming back. Um, but I think that the, the real disconnect here is that people actually, actually believe that what the Fed has created is a legitimate economic recovery and that because we have this real recovery that the Fed no longer has to support the economy with quantitative easing or zero percent interest rates that we can normalize everything no harm no foul uh, and the US economy is going to continue to grow the reality is this is the fug the Fed's biggest bubble ever and I think it's ultimately going to be their swan song because it may well be the last bubble this could be the bubble that finally breaks the dollar despite its recent rally and breaks the Fed and the confidence, the misplaced confidence that people have in the Fed because they cannot end QE, they cannot raise interest rates without bringing on a financial crisis worse than the one that they caused in 2008. And I think for that reason, they will not do that. I think they are ready to queue up and launch QE4 to keep the economy from relapsing back into recession in 2015. And I think that's going to be a game changer for the markets, for the dollar for commodities, for gold, and I think most people are not prepared just like they weren't prepared in January of 2000 or January of 2008. And you predicted both of those. How much bigger do you think this major correction or bottom will be, or, or will it be smaller than 2008? Well, I think it's going to be bigger in the ramifications that it has for investors and for the standard of living of most Americans. I don't know that the stock market is going to be cut in half again the way it was in 2008 and 2000. It would be. If the Federal Reserve doesn't launch QE4 and raises rates, then the carnage on Wall Street is going to be as bad, maybe even worse than 2008. But I think the Fed is not going to let that happen. I think the Fed this time realizes that this bubble is too big to pop and they're going to do whatever they can to prevent it from popping. And so what they end up doing is sacrificing the dollar in order to prop up the stock market, the real estate market, the U.S. government. So I think the impact on the dollar, and the dollar lost a lot of value. Between 2000 and 2008, the dollar index went from 120 down to 70. It's now managed its way back up to about 91. Uh, a lot of those gains happened just in the last few months on all these false expectations. But I think the dollar index is going to decline even even more sure. this time around. So it's even more important for people to be prepared by being out of the dollar. You know, that, that's where the real damage is going to come in the real purchasing power of your savings, of your investments. So people need to be cognizant uh, now about being out of U.S. assets, foreign stocks, precious metals, commodities, things that will retain their value in this inflationary environment that we're going to be living through.
And that was my next question. I mean, I'm not an economist, but I, I just have studied. Well, you know more than most economists. Well, all I know why. is bubbles historically are super dangerous. This infinity bubble that they bet everything on uh, just looks like financial Armageddon if it ever goes. Meanwhile, China is sinking. It looks like some evidence shows, uh, but you're an expert on that. Uh, I mean, correct me if you don't agree. Uh, we see major problems in Russia. Uh, I see them trying to back off global inflation by lowering oil prices, but then that causes its own domino effects uh, in different economies. Uh, I just don't see how they're going to manage uh, all of this. What's the big threat then in the future? Is it inflation or is it deflation? Well, you know, when people talk about inflation, deflation, they're normally referring to consumer prices, not money supply or credit. And so if consumer prices were to come down, that's never a threat. That's always a good thing when the price of the things that you need to buy uh, is, you know, less expensive because nobody has an unlimited amount of money except maybe the central bankers. And so as prices come down, we can have a higher standard of living because we can buy more stuff. Like oil prices have come down recently, so that means that gas is cheaper. That means products could be cheaper that require gasoline in the production process or the transportation process. But um, when when central bankers are talking about deflation, they're trying to pretend that they're worried about falling consumer prices. That's not a concern. That, that's a good thing. What they're worried about is financial assets falling. They're worried about the stock markets coming down, the bond markets coming down, the real estate markets coming down, because they've been propping those markets up to sustain these bubble economies. And what they're also worried about is the inability of governments to repay their debt. And because politicians don't want to admit that they're broke and honestly default on their commitments, they need inflation to wipe out their liabilities. And so that's why central bankers are concerned we don't have enough inflation is because we have so much debt. We need the inflation to wipe it out because we don't have the integrity to honestly default on, on commitments that we can't keep. So we're not going to have falling consumer prices as beneficial as that would be and as temporary as that is for oil, because I think oil prices are going to go much higher with the Fed has to launch QE4, unfortunately, but we're not going to get falling consumer prices. We're going to get skyrocketing consumer prices. And the average sure. American already knows that prices are rising and the government can pretend otherwise with these CPI numbers. But if you go to the supermarket, uh, you know, if you if you pay. Well, that was my bills. next question is <laughs> that everything's going up in price except for gas exponentially the last five, six years. And then I open up the newspaper or, or read the financial online. It's like, boy, uh, prices are dropping and <laughs> Everything's great. And everybody's happy. This is really freaking the public out because they know that's not true. Oh, I know. I mean, that's why the Republicans, unfortunately, why they did so well in the last election is just because the economy is so miserable. Voters are just trying to do whatever they can to express their frustration. Uh, they're not necessarily embracing Republican principles because a lot of the states that, that voted Republicans in and Democrats out also voted to raise the, the minimum wage in their state. So this is just people that are frustrated because there is no legitimate recovery and they see the cost of living is going up. Look, all the prices of the things that I buy Buy. Everything is getting more expensive. I get, you know, letters in the mail from, you know, letting me know what fees are going up. And I mean, nothing is going up as low as what the government. Look at health care. Look at health care. Couldn't that be the final straw that breaks the back? I want to come back with Peter Schiff. OK, we're going to come back to Peter Schiff, Europac.net straight ahead. I'm going to ask him what happens when the dollar dies and how will it die? I mean, we know it's going to fall apart. We are back. Peter Schiff is our guest, financial analyst, uh, broker, author. Financial commentator, manages Euro-Pacific Capital, Inc., and other organizations, Europac.net. A lot of interesting information on that site, certainly. And he is our guest today. This is a short segment, long segment coming up with him. Folks, throughout history, Zimbabwe, Weimar Republic, Germany, you all know better than I that when they start printing money, it causes major problems and, and usually a collapse hyperinflation, war, you name it. Now they found these ways to manipulate it worldwide and have other currencies devalue at the same time. But more and more of that inflation is coming home. And from what I've seen historically, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the inflation builds at first, but slowly and then exponentially it starts compounding, especially when they try to internationalize the money printing, that it's more parabolic towards the end of the graph we knew that something would happen with QE1, 2, and 3. It did create like a sugar high, as it's been called by many. Uh, 
more dollars chasing stocks, that boosts that. So it looks good on paper, but in the real economy, we just talked about it being bad. How long in your gut can this go on? And how do you think the dollar will die? Will it be over time? Will it be in a big a catastrophe? Or will it bounce back? I mean, I know you can't predict the future, but what are some of the scenarios? Yeah, well, first of all, the real economy has suffered during the entirety of this so-called recovery. It's been a financial recovery. Yes, we've managed to prop up stock prices and real estate prices, but at what cost? I think the resources that the Fed has misdirected to Wall Street have come at the expense of Main Street. So instead of making real capital investment, growing our productive capacity, creating high-paying jobs for our people, uh, we're just enriching a few speculators. And so real wages are falling, real household note worth is declining, full-time jobs are being destroyed they're being replaced by part-time jobs the standard of living is going down and and we're disguising it you know within this bubble uh and they can only inflate it so big but what's going on with the dollar right now in inflation is because we're not the only country that's in trouble and there's politicians all around the world that have bought elections with promises they can't keep and people are worried about Europe they're worried about Japan they're worried about China and they're buying the dollar and as a result of that we get a reprieve you know the dollar buys more we can borrow more we can spend more and our bubble gets bigger but people who are buying dollars because they're worried about Europe for example they're jumping out of the frying pan into the fire they don't understand that our problems are even larger than theirs and it's all about confidence and one, one of the reasons that people are confident in the dollar is because they believe that QE is temporary, that the Fed has ended it after three times, and that they're going to raise interest rates. But I think that it's pure fantasy because I think we have too much debt, this bubble is too big, that even a small increase in interest rates will pop it, and then we will have a, a huge financial crisis worse than before. And so the Fed is going to continue uh, to revive QE. Remember, when they did the first one, I said we would have more QEs than Rocky movies, and so far we've had three, and I think we had five or six Rocky movies. So we have a few more to go. <laughs> but the reason I knew they would have so much QE is because I knew it wouldn't work. And because it doesn't work, because it exacerbates the very problems that you're trying to solve, the solution is always to do more of it. And I think when we have to come out with a bigger round of QE, that could be the beginning of the end of the confidence. And, you know, look at what's happening in, in Russia right now. The ruble is down uh, precipitously, 40, 50 odd percent or so. Uh, they're responding by raising interest rates. Short-term interest rates in Russia are 17 percent. The Russian economy is slowing down, but it's not broken. They're withstanding 17 percent interest rates. Imagine what's going to happen in America when there's a loss of confidence in the Fed and, and the dollar and our currency starts to drop. What are we going to do to protect it? Can we raise interest rates to 17 percent like they're doing in Russia? Not a chance because we have so much more debt than we, they do. We can't afford 17 percent we can't afford seven percent i don't even think we can afford one percent so we're really in a bind when the dollar goes there's no way to stop it from falling doesn't it become a catch-22 because the world runs back into the dollar knowing it's the biggest piece of the pie of this whole unstable mess but as they run into it that only accelerates uh, the establishments uh, leaning towards printing more of it which then in tune just makes the bubble that much bigger I mean, it's every bubble is popped. I mean, how big could it potentially get before it pops? It's already, it's already enormous. But, you know, as long as people want dollars, we can keep creating them. But what happens when they don't want them anymore? And we've created too many. Look, that's what happened with real estate. They kept building houses as people were buying them. But then when they didn't want them anymore, you had this huge supply of houses that nobody could afford. And the prices come down. Stay there. I want to come back and ask you how it unravels, what it looks like, and then other trends for 2015. Stay with us. Peter Schiff. All I want is prosperity and justice and to live in a free country. And our monetary control has been taken away from Congress. The private Federal Reserve has transferred it to other foreign interests. And they use our national faith and credit as a giant cash machine for speculators, as Peter Schiff was just saying. And I look at who's financing restrictions on guns and free speech. It's the very same group of Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, allied organizations that just want to take over the planet. Then they scapegoat capitalism for their crony capitalist system that they've set up. It's just amazing. We're going to talk to Peter Schiff, and I'm going to try to give him the floor about what he thinks coming in 2015, other big issues, Obamacare. What is that going to do to the economy? 
People are scared to hire. They're cutting people back from full-time to part-time. Uh, folks are seeing their payroll taxes go up. We'll talk about that with Peter Schiff from Europac.net. Doesn't need any introduction to this audience or pretty much any other audience. Um, one of the most popular and uh, accurate uh, analysts out there. Before we go any further, though, we created InfoWarsLife.com to bring you the best missing link products that no one had developed or that we could develop better. Things like Oxy Powder that has time release oxygen in the upper and lower intestine. And, well, you know, John Wayne, when he died, had like 45 pounds of unadjusted food in him. This blows all that out unlike anything you've seen. We have the resolution pack, the biggest discount ever on InfoWarsLife.com products. We're only running this for another week and a half. It is a bottle of Oxy Powder, Secret 12, proprietary vitamin B12, and super male or super female vitality to help supercharge you in your weight loss and exercise this year. Believe me, this stuff works together in synergy. Infowarslife.com or 888-253-3139. And your purchase does help fund our media operation. We don't get stimulus money like MSNBC or $450 million like NPR to put out all their propaganda. We simply sell high-quality nutraceuticals at InfoWarsLife.com. InfoWarsStore.com has all of the Made in America apparel lines, pro Second Amendment books, films, high-quality water filtration systems, hundreds and hundreds of great products that I personally use, survival stoves, uh, Made in America, pro-gun belt buckles, uh, silver coins, the whole nine yards, InfoWarsStore.com or 888 Two five three three one three nine. And again, I want to thank you all in the new year for uh, being patrons of InfoWarsStore.com and spreading the word about the broadcast. You are the power of this transmission. Okay, Peter, uh, specifically other areas of the economy, Obamacare, what to look for next year, what you personally are telling all the folks uh, wealth, uh, whose uh, wealth you manage, what are other big issues we face? And then finishing up, Maybe now, specifically, what could trigger the dollar dying? What would it look like? What are some of the scenarios? How bad would it be? Would inflation suddenly just explode, or what would that look like? Well, I think I was talking about it a little bit before the break, but you know, once once it changes, it does change very rapidly because when the confidence is lost in the currency, and we've been printing a lot of dollars because people have wanted dollars, uh, but they wanted them because they didn't understand the fundamentals. When they figure it out, they're not going to want them anymore. Meanwhile, we have an enormous supply. We have all this debt outstanding, and the Federal Reserve has been buying a lot of it, but there, are, there, there has been private demand. Uh, for that debt as well. But when that private demand is gone, uh, the Federal Reserve is not going to start contracting the money supply. They're not going to start, you know, reducing the amount of money out there because nobody wants dollars anymore. It's going to be the opposite. As people don't want to buy U.S. Treasuries or dollar-denominated mortgages, the Fed is just going to print even more money to buy the bonds that nobody wants. But now you're increasing the supply of dollars just as demand for those dollars is going up. And then the velocity really picks up because anybody who has a dollar wants to get rid of it as quickly as possible before it loses value because nobody wants to be left a hold in the bag. So I think once it accelerates, it's not just like a snowball rolling down a hill where it just gets bigger gradually. All of a sudden, I think, you know, you get a lot of snow very, very quickly and you can get crushed. So I think people have to prepare way in advance, you know, before that snowball, uh, you know, becomes a boulder uh, while they can still do something about it. But there are a lot of warning signs. I mean, you look at the price of oil coming down and we can all be happy. Hey, this is great. I can go and I can I can get some gasoline cheaper. But I think this is just an example of what's going to happen in asset markets uh, without the help of the Fed. Because it's not just oil prices that were pushed up by cheap money, stock prices, real estate prices, bond market. What's going to happen when all the markets look like the oil market? What's going to happen when they all come crashing down like they did in 2008? So, you know, you can be happy now, but you have to understand the, the reason that oil prices are coming down is not good as far as uh, what's going to happen to the economy in the short run. Uh, and, you know, it didn't stop the, the big drop in oil prices in 2008, didn't stop the Great Recession. It didn't stop the financial crisis. We still had it, even though we had the relief of, uh, of cheaper gas. So I think without the Fed 
uh, doing another round of QE. We're going to see that kind of carnage in these other asset markets. And, you know, I think this whole recovery, because remember, the recovery that the Fed built is based on asset bubbles. That's the foundation of this financial recovery is stock prices going up and real estate price, prices going up. But this is not benefiting the average American. The average American doesn't own stocks anymore. That's why CNBC's ratings just hit a new record low in 2014, despite the fact that the stock market is going up. And home ownership rates just hit a new 20-year low, despite the fact that real estate prices are going up, because the average American can't buy a house, even with the lowest mortgage rates ever and 3% down payments, they're still too broke. And so most Americans now are more Americans are renting. And so the wealth is only being, uh, you know, distributed uh, to a very small a fraction of the population. What concerns me most, Peter, is that now we see the paramilitary armored vehicles, the training, the riot training proliferating everywhere. And it was easy for me to say six, seven years ago, this is in preparation for economic collapse. But now the Pentagon and others admit that's what it's for. And they're using other events mm -hmm. as a pretext to kind of condition the public. Uh, but yeah. when the government itself is hardening its facilities and storing food and weapons mm -hmm. and saying, well, we're afraid of economic disasters, that shows that they understand they're not in control of this. And if other governments in history didn't have the computers to manipulate things, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they can keep the bubble going forever. But that itself is unnatural. I mean, what goes up must come down, especially when it's not based on reality. And you've got China uh, with, with, with its issues, its growth not as big as they thought. You've got Russia. You've got Japan with all its problems. It just seems like the United States, even though we have the world reserve currency, can't be isolated forever. And you add government getting prepared feverishly. Well, yeah. Uh, and and, and I'll, I think because the dollar is the world's, world's reserve currency, we've been spared from suffering the full consequences of, of our own profligacy, and that's what can't go on forever. And I think one of the burdens that the global economy is bearing right now is supporting the United States. You know, we just had our trade deficit last week, and we had our biggest deficit ever in manufactured goods. So that means the rest of the world has to manufacture goods that we consume but we can't afford to pay for. There is a big cost to supporting 300 million Americans who collectively are no longer very productive because we're involved in all this service sector uh, employment and so many Americans don't even work anymore. I mean, you mentioned that, uh, the shrinking labor force participation. One of the reasons, the primary reason that the unemployment rate has come down is because one, so many people have left the labor force, they've just thrown in the towel, so they're no longer counted as unemployed. But a lot of people have had to accept part-time jobs in lieu of full-time jobs, and so they're not counted as being unemployed either, but they're underemployed. And in fact, if you look at the people who are getting jobs, uh, the, the net jobs are going to people who are in their 50s and 60s. Labor force participation among 60 and 70 year olds is rising sharply. And for 20 and 30 year olds, it's collapsing to record lows. You've got older people who don't want to work, who are being forced into part-time employment in order to pay the electric bills. And then you have uh, Americans in their 30s and 40s who need full-time jobs, but all they can get is a part-time job. And the younger people who maybe want a part-time job while they're in school, they can't even get those jobs because their grandparents have those jobs, and they get you know they they can't compete uh, because they don't have they don't have the skills or the experience. Sure. And now you've got all these people say, well, the solution is to raise the minimum wage because everybody is stuck with a minimum wage job. That's not going to solve the problem. That's just going to destroy the minimum wage jobs. In fact, 20 states were dumb enough to raise their minimum wage today. And so that's going to make it that much more expensive for businesses to hire people in those states. And so there's going to be I was be about to say, explain to people why a minimum wage is a bad idea and never works. Well, because you, you, you cannot dictate productivity, right? The government can set a price, but they can't force anybody to pay that price. So when it comes to labor, if the government wants to say, well, you've got to pay somebody $10 an hour, or you can't hire them. Well, if that person doesn't deliver $10 of productivity, then no employer is going to hire them. Uh, and, and so what you do is you make it illegal for significant per you know, percentages of the population to get jobs. And the people who are most affected are younger low-skilled workers who desperately need a job. 
they need a job and work experience more than they need the money. Because if they can get their foot in the door and actually learn something on the job, then years later, they could make many times the minimum wage. But if you knock the bottom rung off of the job ladder, then millions of people never climb on. So it's not the entrepreneur or the business owner that suffers. It's the guy who doesn't get a job, who doesn't get a career. And of course, all consumers suffer because they end up paying higher well, sure. prices for the goods that they buy. There are, you know, this, this is one of the dumbest things you could do. And, and it's one of the simplest things that you can even explain because it's just basic supply and demand. Everybody knows if you make something more expensive, as the price goes up, the demand goes down. So if you make hiring people more expensive, then fewer people will get hired. I mean, that's basic economics, and you can't get around that any more than you can get around the laws of gravity. Well, that takes me to my next point. You know, your dad, best-selling author, writing about the Federal Reserve, writing about the IRS from a conspiratorial angle, look at how it's been proven the IRS is persecuting people politically who are libertarian, Christian, or conservative. You, uh, you know, have always taken the approach of, you know, it's just corrupt forces, but, you know, there's not really a centralized conspiracy. But from the Cloward and Piven liberal socialist perspective, they knew NAFTA and GATT weren't really free trade and would actually get rid of our jobs. They know Obamacare will make tens of millions of people be kicked off full-time to part-time. They know raising uh, payroll taxes will push people into poverty and just make them go on welfare. They know, uh, as you said, two plus two, yeah. supply and demand. We know yeah. what this does. So the social engineers, uh, I'm not saying it's one monolith, but they really do want us domesticated. They want us dependent. They want us a service well, economy. Well, the, the government always wants to create dependencies so that way they can count on your support. When people are bankrupted and the government promises a handout, that's what Harry Brown used to always say, that the government is great at breaking your leg and then handing you a crutch and then saying, see, without me, you couldn't walk. This is the strategy of government. But government destroys every industry sure. that they infect. So it Look, is a conspiracy, yeah. though. Well, not a, necessarily a conspiracy. People are just acting in their own self-interest. Politicians want power. And since, unfortunately, it's a democracy and not a republic, the, 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 the power is where the votes are. And so they need to count on votes. And this is what they do. Like, look at education. The government got involved in education. And what is the consequence? Look at colleges. The, the value of a college degree has collapsed, but the price of getting one has skyrocketed. And so now, because of government, we have kids 23, 24, 25, finishing a four-year degree, it now takes five or six years to get a four-year degree. You graduate, you got fifty dollars to $100,000 worth of debt, and you know nothing. You majored in some Mickey Mouse liberal arts you know, discipline, and so you learn nothing valuable. You have no marketable skills, and because everybody and their brother has the same worthless degree as you, it means nothing to I was about to say, apprenticing. <laughs> I mean, in the old days, people would go worldwide and be an apprentice for a year or two, proving how hard they would work to then get a good-paying or high-paying job with that company, and many times the head of the firms, whether it was a factory, a law firm, brokerage, uh, you know, a hundred other professions, carpentry, was whoever was the smartest and hardest working. S lawyers didn't used to go to law school. No. Uh, they yeah. went and apprenticed with another lawyer yeah. and then sat in front of the bar. So they've gotten rid of that completely. I mean, yeah, interns, you, know, Alex, you try to get yeah. interns and even pay them, they oh. won't do any work. Carnegie, Mellon, Rockefeller, billionaires never went to college, never went to high school, so they didn't even graduate elementary school. You know, it, it used to be very rare in America to go to college. If you wanted to be a doctor, I mean, you go to college, but most people didn't go to college, and they were able to be very successful, whether they had a blue-collar career or ended up being the head of a, of, of, a, of a Fortune 500 company, working their way from the mailroom to the boardroom. They didn't start in the mailroom with a college degree. They just worked hard, and they worked out of that mailroom, but now you can't even get into the mailroom probably without a college degree and even then it's probably hard but you know i did this video i don't know if you ever saw it it's on youtube i did it when i was at the new orleans conference a couple of years ago uh and if you go on youtube and you type in my name peter schiff college you can see this five or six minute video where i'm walking around bourbon street and i'm interviewing all the you know the bartenders and the the the, the pedicab drivers and the barkers at the strip clubs and i'm asking them if they went to college what their major was you know how much student loans they have and just about everybody i talked to was a college grad doing exactly. menial jobs and this is the reality and thank the government for this you know it, this is why you know they, they have created this bubble 
in education, in college degrees, just like they created a bubble in housing. We have a bubble, you know, in the dollar, in the bond market. All this thing collapses. I mean, it's collapsing now in education because you got all these young kids who are now too broke. You know, they 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 went, they left home to go to college, and now they're right back in home in the same uh, bedroom that they grew up in because they're too broke to move out of the house. Even if they get a job, they can't make their student loan payments, and there's no good jobs available because the government has destroyed the economy. Exactly, and now the answer is more education, more <laughs> debt, when all you learn is a bunch of political correct garbage. But that was the point I was getting at, is that you used to go to work in companies, and the college was learning how that company worked and how it operated, and then if you performed, then you would move up. But, but more and more, people with college degrees, you name it, they don't want to work. In fact, they think doing, and, and so it's not just the elite here, we become a nation of TV heads, Peter, and I'm really worried about this country. But what you even do in college, very little of what you study has any relevance to any job that you might be able to get once you graduate. And most people, college is just a five or six year excuse to have a party. You know, you live, you know, you go to parties and you, you know, you go, you know, and you get drunk and, you know, you, th that's it. You don't really learn anything. You just go through the motions because you've been you've been brainwashed into thinking you need to have this diploma. And that somehow is your ticket to Easy Street. And if you don't have this diploma, you know, you're going to be nothing. I mean, Peter, we've got a final segment. Stay with us for another five minutes, six minutes on the other side. Europac.net. I want to come back and ask you about other trends in 2015. What you think is going to happen with Obama, the Republicans? Uh, if they don't repeal Obamacare, how can they get away with that? Looks like they may remove Boehner. Good news on that front. Uh, we're going to talk to Peter Schiff about that straight ahead. On the other side, Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv are our sites. I'm Alex Jones. The circle is now complete. The final segment of the first live show of 2015. I'll be back this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. Central with the Sunday broadcast. Don't forget, Infowars Nightly News tonight, 7 o'clock Central. And this is the house that you, the listeners, built, spreading the word and supporting us. So God bless you all. Final segment with Peter Schiff, a financial analyst, talk show host, best-selling uh, author, researcher, commentator, you name it. And he's uh, here with us right now. Finishing up, other key points you'd like to make, other things you think we should go over. I mean, we see how these bubbles are popping, how old folks have got to work now. We're told it's the best economy ever, but... A new poll out today by Gallup shows the public doesn't trust the government and sees it as the number one threat. All these lines are coming together. What do you see in 2015, 2016? When does your gut tell you the breaking point is and what is that breaking point? I think the frustration is going to get deeper and deeper because so many people know from their own experience that things are getting worse, that they're trapped in debt, that the cost of living is going up, their employment prospects have diminished, yet they keep hearing how great things are, and they assume that it must be great for somebody else, and maybe they think it's the rich, the 1%, and there's a lot of uh, envy and class warfare, um, and a lot of those fires are being stoked by, by the politicians, so it's going to get worse, and you know, there's an example of uh, being careful what you wish for. I think the Republicans doing so well in capturing capturing the Senate could come back uh, uh, to, to hurt us in that it's going to allow uh, the Democrats to now run against the Republican-controlled Congress when the recovery res uh, goes away and the recession resumes in 2015, 2016. Now the voters might blame the weak economy on the Republicans in Congress rather than the man in the White House. So it might make it more difficult to recapture that House or maybe even retain the Congress in the 2016 elections because people are going to be a lot more pissed off then than they are now because the economy is going to be much weaker. We may even officially be back in recession session. And if, if if the people buy more of that snake oil, if the, if the politicians that destroy the economy benefit from its destruction because they can promise more relief in the form of more, you know, political and monetary snake oil that they peddle, it doesn't work. It could be a very, very dangerous, dangerous time. The London Telegraph has the headline, the year of dollar danger for the world. And it says that there will no longer be an automatic Fed put. Do you agree with that statement? What do you think that Overall no, means. no, I think, I think the Fed put is coming back. I, I do not believe the Fed is going to sit by and allow all the bubbles that they work so hard to inflate deflate. 
because they're not going to allow stocks to crash. They're not going to allow real estate to crash when they built this whole phony recovery on those very bubbles. See, the idea that the Fed can stop the stimulus and not collapse the markets is like saying a drug addict can stop taking drugs and stay high. It is impossible. If you want the high, you need to keep doing the drugs. And unfortunately, we got the big pusher at the Fed, and we're going to do these drugs. So the dollar's not going to go up. It's going to collapse. We've got a minute and a half left. Uh, poll out 60% of Republicans want, uh, in Congress want Boehner gone. Uh, Obamacare is such a criminal monstrosity. I think it's a litmus test. If we can't repeal this or make the Republicans do it, I think the sky's the limit. I mean, Obamacare is so evil. As somebody that has 45 people working for me, knowing how health care works, my dad's in health care management, it's so evil that if they can keep this in yeah. place when it's so unpopular, even with Democrats, then this country's yeah. done. And, and it's just getting started. I mean, remember how, how, you know, when they first made these promises about Medicaid or Medicare, it was supposed to be so small, cost so little, and that thing blew up. This is a much bigger experiment than that, and it's blowing up, you know, right out of the gate. I mean, so this thing is going to be much bigger. I guess the good news is the whole economy is going to collapse before we have to deal with the full weight of the problems brought about by Obamacare. What do you think of them pushing Jeb and Hillary again? Yeah, that's all we need.